Okay. All right. Good. All right. Anybody else got something? If not, I think I'm pretty happy. I think you are too. So why don't we sing great birthdays? I meant birthdays. March 21st. Okay. Birthdays and anniversaries. See, I always need that. Um, Joey? Nick? Really? <laughs> Is she downstairs? Yeah. All right, Layla. All right, she turns one next Saturday. Wow. All right. Uh, anybody else? Birthdays. All right. Any anniversaries? All right. Then let's sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And um, when we sing that, or as we find, as I find my page number. I'd like to thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, so often we hear about churches that have not done well in the last year because of the um, virus uh, outbreak, but uh, you all have been faithful in your giving and your attending, no matter if it's been in person or electronically or out in the parking lot. So thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, it's 139, and uh, if you have an offering, you want to place in the offering plates while we're singing this song, make your way up to the front. 139, great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father. All right? And you always sound best when you're standing. <clears throat> great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Great is Thy faithfulness, great is Thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hand hath provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, Sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to Thy great faithfulness, mercy, and... Now let me hear you. Great is Thy faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hand hath provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, and pardon for sin. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. <laughs> Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hand hath provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All right, amen. Everybody can have a seat. And uh, while we get, I'm going to get my hymn book ready. Um, I had to uh, show Dakota before we got started that the clock on the wall did not actually disappear. Uh, Tim back there suggested that I put it right there so I don't have to be so obvious and check my watch. I can look right there and see what time we're running. I know that lunch is coming up hip hip. All right. And uh, let's see. I, I know that you all get hungry. Um, I had two of the greatest sweet rolls this morning with my cups of coffee. So, 
I'm okay for a while. Um, well, first off, let me just do this. Braxton, will you please stand up? All right, now stay up there. Vicki, will you please stand up? Okay, that's all I wanted to show you. Okay, Braxton's here with us. Uh, Joey brought his son, Carson. Welcome, Carson. So, uh, good seeing everybody. Take a look at our prayer needs, please. Um, Bunny continues. I th- has she already had all of her treatments? Mary, do you know? She's had them all? Okay, the 17th, okay. All right, Mary and Tim are with us. Tim, thank you. You did a great job for me this week. He saved me some money. I'm going to buy him some lunch. I don't care what he says about that. But Tim was able to get out to our new house and help me. Mary's here with us. Hallelujah, right? She's feeling better, okay. Uh, She's still hanging around the same guy, but she is feeling better. Uh, uh, Any word about Dina's surgery coming up? Okay. Joanne, any more word about your surgery coming up? No? All right. So let's hang in there. Um, uh, Let's see. I'm looking. I'm looking. Hang on. I'm looking. Um, Don and Chantelle are in better shape. Uh, Leah called us today, and she has some... Uh, ugly kind of symptoms this morning, so uh, keep Leah in your prayers. Mike asked that we pray for a friend of theirs down in uh, Florida, Richard, who is in, uh, um, go ahead, uh, ICU with, with the, he's in a coma with the virus. All right, so please pray for Richard. He's down in Florida. Um, and I think that's pretty much all I want to say. If any of you ever want to catch up on some of our missionaries, uh, I get emails all the time from Indy, from the Osterbrocks, from the Clemmers. Uh, so um, uh, don't be afraid to ask me sometime for details about what's going on with them. But uh, let's keep them in our prayers. Things are going good. Mary? Yep. 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 Um, if some of you know who Beth Sibsey uh, was, but she married Mark Pennington and she passed away this week. Okay. And Mark's dad just passed away within the last year or so. Am I right? Yeah. 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 Mark's dad passed away. Yeah. Uh, okay. Others? Okay. Let's. I, I get a. Did you hear me sigh? Daniel, did you hear me say that? I guess it's kind of like I let some air out, and then I say, okay, now let's pray. All right, Lord, we want to thank you for hearing us when we lift our voices to you, whether it be in song, whether it be in prayer, whether it be in praise, or whether it be in preaching, whether it be in witnessing, or whether it be in accepting that witness as we trust Christ as our Lord and our Savior. We thank You that You hear us. We thank You, Lord, that Your faithfulness is so great to us and there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that we need that You withhold. We thank You for the blessing of Your hand. We thank You for the blessing of Your face. That not only do we we receive blessings materially, but we receive the blessing of Your presence. And as if we could look right into Your face, we thank You that You're always with us, never to leave us alone, uh, uh, never to allow us to worry, because You've told us to fear not. We ask, Lord, that You'd bless those that we continue to have on our prayer list, uh, Deacon and Lori, and we lift up DJ to You today. We pray that you would be with Joanne and Dina as they're awaiting word about their surgery, as Bunny is receiving word about the results of the treatments, as Mary's getting stronger and better. We lift up to you some of our parents, and as many of us are very involved in taking care of them, we pray for Georgia and Cleo. We pray for Hazel. Uh, We ask, Lord, that you'd be with Brian as, again, he's continuing to work with Cleveland Clinic, Scott and Autumn. We pray for Nancy and ask a blessing. We pray for Sharon. And we thank you, Lord, for Don's getting better. Chantel, we pray that you'd help her. We ask that you'd watch over Leah this morning as she's pretty sick. 
And as Richard is in a coma, we pray, Lord, that your will would perfectly be done in his life as well as in the life of those who are tending to his needs. It always saddens our heart, Lord, when we know that a loved one has passed away, and so we pray that you'd be with um, uh, the Sibsey and Pennington family as Beth has passed away. And we thank you, Lord, that she's in glory land. We ask you to just bless the family as they hurt, knowing that she's no longer here but with you now. And we lift up the causes um, to which we have joined forces. Uh, for Camp Kirkwood, for Resurrection Crossing, uh, for Indy. And, Lord, we pray that you'd be with the Osterbrocks as they're waiting word to go back to Malaysia. We pray that you'd be with the Clemmers as it seems as one or both of them are always in harm's way. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless the different teams that are going to Haiti, and we pray that you'd bless our church that we might be able to schedule some folks to get to go yet this summer. And now, Lord, as we've all come together, yes, to praise your name, yes, to pray, and yes, to give our tithes and our offerings, as well as our attendance. We pray, Lord, that as much as the preacher's mind has been scattered and his body might be tired, we pray, Lord, that... His tongue might be used by your Holy Spirit to deliver inspiration to those of us who remain until that day you call us home to be with you. So bless the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts because it is in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, we ask it. Amen. Well, Lynn and I have almost made the complete move. We did not... I told a lie this morning. I, I said that I put the piano on my back and carried it out of our house and into our new house. If you believe that, i got a horse I'll sell you. Um, but, um, but our move is almost complete. Um, and uh, uh, thank you all for praying for us during that time. The preacher is not all that tired. I didn't have to move the freezer or the, uh, the washer and dryer. We had movers that came. Um, uh, if I'll say this on airwaves, if Jimmy... Um, uh, Kendrick hears me. Uh, he'll send me a discount on our move, but uh, the Kendricks moved us so well. Those boys ran carrying boxes. Uh, I've never seen anybody running, moving somebody up and down ramps. All right, so enough advertisement. Now, a word from our sponsor. Turn with me to John's Gospel and find... 11 and 12 chapters. Chapters 11 and 12 of John's Gospel. Today I'd like to continue that pre-Easter series on the friends of Jesus. I said this last week. I'd like to hang with that, um, that ideology, that thought, that if anybody would ever be listed or named as a friend of Jesus, I would like to volunteer for that job. How about you? I would like to be counted as one of his friends. We find in the Gospels, as much as he had the disciples, as much as there would be a crowd on the hillside that would listen to the beautiful Beatitudes, we find there are three people in Scripture that were referred to as those whom he loved. They were friends of Jesus. Last week we talked about Martha and her warm home, and her hospitality. Uh, Today, we talk about Martha's brother. His name? Lazarus. And Jesus raised him from the dead. So while we read about him, why don't you rise as we read a bit of the Scripture in response to it and honoring it, we stand. John 11, the first five verses... And John 12, verses 9, 10, and 11. I'll try to keep that straight with us. John 11, the first five verses. Now, a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, 
but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Hold on, three more verses. John 12, verses 8. Uh, let me think. No, 9, 10, and 11. See, I told you I'd try to keep it straight. John 12. Uh, John 12, 9, 10, and 11. Now a great many of the Jews knew that He was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom He, that is Jesus, raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Now, you may be seated, and I invite you to keep my simple thoughts on the sheet of paper before you. I want to simply make this statement as we get ready. I want to make a point here. When we take a look at Martha and Lazarus, any idea who we're going to focus on next Sunday? Any ideas? Mary. Mary of Bethany. Now I've revealed the three friends of Jesus. Please come back. Nonetheless, you know who we're going to focus on. But when we take a focus on these three, we do not find them recorded in Scripture that they traveled with Christ. We do not see that they went any place but Bethany. We know that up and down Israel, east and west and north and south, the disciples traveled with Jesus. We know that. We know that there was lots of people who came and uh, think of the blind man who cried out, you know, asking for a healing. Um, think about the widow whose son was dead and Jesus came up to the casket and raised him from the dead. Think of all those places that Jesus came and went from pillar to post and yet we don't see these three traveling. I'll make a comment. And as much as earlier we prayed for our missionaries, I realize that some of us are called to a mission field that may be far away. I mentioned last week that um, uh, Gary and Sis and Lynn and I were able to sit in a church service together. I want to tell you something. Since college, I don't know that I sat beside my little brother for a church service. That's been... Okay, 127 years ago. No, not that long ago. But I, I could not remember the last time I sat with my little brother in a church service. He and his wife were called away in the mission field, and Gary uh, supplies ministry through Spanish sign language. What an amazing thing. God called, Gary insists, to a mission field away. If we're not away, God still calls us to a mission field. But where is your mission field? Well, it must be right here. It must be around you, right? Uh, in your job or in your school or in your neighborhood. God calls some to a mission away. God calls all to mission, but it might be where you are right now. Sometimes we play up foreign missionaries, God had called Mary and Martha and Lazarus to be missionaries in Bethany. And as a matter of fact, what a mission Lazarus was able to fulfill. The other thing I'd like to say as a form of introduction here, remember, I got two hours of air time. I'm, come on, smile with me, okay? Um, all right. But Jesus practiced what He preached. Aren't you glad that we have a Savior that practiced what He preached? Uh, may I say this, and I don't care if I offend someone out there or not, but it amazes me that a chubby little uh, fella uh, dressed in a loincloth sits with his legs crossed um, and he looks uh, um, twice the weight that he ought to be would be speaking of self-denial. That little fella that some people have in their home or on their dashboard, that little Buddha statue. 
It amazes me. I don't know that he ever practiced what he really preached. If you go into the history of Muhammad and his personal life, you will discover that that man was a sexual predator. And yet around the world, people who follow Islam worship him. All right? It amazes me. May I say this publicly, loud and clear? We have a Savior who practices what he preaches. All right? He, in John chapter 11, shared with Mary and Martha that he was the resurrection. Wouldn't it be a stinking crime that he couldn't raise himself from the dead? He is the resurrection. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, practices what He preached. Hallelujah. Alright. Now, before, and still a form of introduction, once before, as we have gone through the book now of Genesis and Exodus, and in our speaking in the book of Joshua, in speaking of miracles, somewhere along the line, I said this, that sometimes critics will critique the Bible and say that miracles were only something that would have happened naturally that God put into fast motion. Did you remember me saying that one time or another? In other words, um, when Jesus turned water into wine, well, naturally occurring... Water does turn to wine, but it takes a long time. The rain comes down. Uh, the water is supplied to the roots of a vine. The vine forms leaves, then buds, then grapes, and then they take the grapes and mash them, and ultimately you get wine. Do you understand that? So some people will criticize the Bible and say, Ah, Jesus didn't do that big a thing. He just did it in fast motion. I think that's a very poor way of looking at miracles. Amen? Oh, but preacher, you have to turn around on this one. And now I'm going to tell you that the miracle that takes place in the life of Lazarus is something that would have happened that Jesus put into fast motion. All right. The resurrection. All right. It was going to happen, and as a matter of fact, please look forward with me, if you don't mind, to uh, uh, chapter 11, verse 24. All right. Martha said to him, Jesus, I know that he will rise again in the rection at the last day. Okay, fair enough. But when will Jesus, uh, will Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? When? On the fourth day, he was gone. All right? So, this is a miracle, just like any resurrection, just like the great day of resurrection. But Jesus, on behalf of Mary and Martha and all those Jews who came to mourn and weep and wail over Lazarus' death, Jesus did it in fast motion and raised Lazarus from the dead. All right. With all of these things said and done, I would like for you to reference something quickly. It is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 forward. All right? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to the end of that chapter. Some of you already know where I'm going. Let me help you. Uh, as last night I was going to sleep with these thoughts on my mind, this morning I got up, I opened this, and I thought, where is this sermon going? And I want to tell you now that every once in a while you and I need to be encouraged with God's Word because the old devil comes along and says, what are you doing believing that stuff? Has Satan ever tempted you that way? Please be honest with me. What are you doing believing in that stuff? Well, let me encourage your faith. We have it on the very Word of God. And so, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 on, listen to this. Paul helps that Thessalonian church, and us too. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who are dead, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, do you believe that, everybody? And rose again. Do you believe that, everybody? 
Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep or who are dead in Jesus. Now, wait a minute. In order for Jesus to bring them with him, where are they now? Please help me. They're buried. Where are they really right now? They're in heaven. They're already in heaven. Their soul is with Christ now. Because He, when He returns, will bring them with Him. Let's keep going, boys and girls. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Wait a minute. I thought they were already with Jesus. What part of them will rise? Their bodies will. All right. If we got that right, look at verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, this is the heaven of heaven, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Boys and girls, someday... A resurrection will take place and graves will split open and dead bodies will be resurrected. They'll come out of the ground. They'll come out of the urns. They'll come out of the ocean. They will be raised. But Jesus already has their souls with them. There'll be some kind of a wonderful reuniting of their souls and a resurrected body. If we remain until that day, guess what we won't have to do? We won't have to die. We will just be sapped up, zoomed, um, uh, resurrected. We'll be um, raptured and be with Christ forever. Is anybody happy to know what the future holds for Christians? Oh boy, some of you are asleep. Okay, all right. Wait a minute. You're already sleeping in the Lord. Come on, smile with me, please. All right, come on. Is anybody happy about what's going to happen to us someday? Woo! All right, hallelujah. All right. I want to say this. This is a quote. This is not original. But I was so impressed with that quote that I literally wrote it right here in the front of my Bible. He didn't pass. He got futured. For He is now in our future awaiting us. When we talk about the passing of a, a relative, they pass from this earth, but where do they go? You've got to pass from somewhere to somewhere else, right? When we think about a person dying, we could also reference that as they have been futured. They've been shot into the future where we shall also be with the Lord forever. Doesn't that make that neat? Uh, sometimes... Uh, more than often, more than you realize, I look back or I remember back on some of my relatives. My grandpa was my best friend. My grandma was my best teacher. And she did it with very few words. She lived it. And I still have her Bible and I learned so much from just watching her with her Bible. They're not past. We didn't lose them. We know where they are. And they got futured. And sometimes, I even told Jim this. As a matter of fact, I caught myself not hearing him. Maybe the last time I got to speak with Jim Gibson, but I got real close to him and I said, Jim, if you get there before I go, will you please tell Grandma and Grandpa Owens that I'm doing okay? And before I left, I heard him in this weak voice say, Owen, Owen, and Lynn, were you with me? You had to say, hey, he's speaking to you. He wanted to make sure that he had their name right. That gives me chill bumps. It makes me want to cry. Listen, when we have somebody that dies, they get shot into the future. That's where we're going to be. Don't be sad for them, right? All right, now, the preacher's getting ready to start, okay? Say hip, hip. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Psalm uh, 146, verse 4. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Psalm 146, 4. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. 
All right, so we got a great way. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, kids uh, are, are tuned in to this stuff of our culture today about ghosts and about zombies and about all this stuff. May I tell you, there is no such thing as a ghost that's roaming around this earth of someone who has passed away and their spirit didn't make it somewhere. That is rubbish. Everybody say amen on that. All right. The Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews, appointed unto every person is death and thereafter the judgment. We leave here and we stand before our God. Okay? And there is no ghost that's traveling around. Oh, correct yourself, preacher. There is one ghost that travels around. His first name is what? Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God roams about and He blesses His children. All right. Lazarus was in heaven. Only his body was in the grave. And let's get this right. John 11.35, our best Bible verse for vacation Bible school to earn an extra cookie. 11.35 is what? Jesus wept. Now listen to me. The reason Jesus wept is because Mary and Martha were loved by Him very much. When he saw them crying, he wept. When he got to the grave and he realized that his best friend, one of his best friends, had been dead four days, he wept. When he stood before that stone in this cave of a tomb, and he was about to speak to them to move that stone away, he wept. When Mary and Martha said, Oh, oh, Jesus, don't do that. Certainly, He smells. There's a stench. The Jews themselves believed this. But after three days, a person would certainly be dead. There was no mistaking. There was, there was no correcting. There was nothing to be done. So therefore, on the fourth day, Jesus arrives and speaks to them, move the stone. They object. Jesus weeps. When the stone is rolled away, He gets ready to speak those simple words. Let me get you into the pathos of that moment, the feelings, the emotions of that moment. Jesus knew where Lazarus was. Now, come on. Don't answer too quickly. Where was Lazarus? In heaven. Uh, Listen to this. Let me see if I wrote it down. There it is. Psalm 145, verse 2. I will praise your name forever and ever. Lazarus was in heaven joining the angels in choruses of praise to God Almighty. He thought he was there forever and ever. He knew nothing about returning back into his body and staying on the earth for any time longer. He thought he was at home. And when Jesus calls forth and says, Lazarus, come forth, Jesus cried because he was removing his best friend from His forever home. Wouldn't you have cried? Guys, listen to this. Let let the preacher just plain talk you for a minute. Uh, I'm telling you what, I cried. I cried out loud at my grandpa's funeral. Um, I, 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 I cried at my grandma's funeral. But they wouldn't want me to cry. And if there was any way possible to bring them back, My grandma, about this tall, and she even wore those black uh, heels that uh, old farm ladies used to wear. I don't even know what to call those shoes. But she was about this tall with those heels on. She would say, Steve, don't do that! Leave me here! Do you think Lazarus could have objected when he heard... I'm getting chill bumps. When he heard Jesus call his name, Lazarus, no! Don't do it! I'm home! I'm enjoying myself. I'm not in pain anymore. I'm no longer sick. 
and he stands at attention when his name is called. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. No wonder Jesus cried. He had to pull his best friend out of heaven. There are four things I want to say about Lazarus and Jesus. Here it comes. Number one, he was a friend of Jesus. Jesus loved he and his sisters. One day, Jesus would tell a story. Now, I'm going to tell you that the preacher may not be absolutely correct on this, and so you can correct me later. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells us a story about the rich man and, come on, the, no, well, yes, he was poor, but what was his name? Come on, you said it, Lazarus. Jesus tells a story uh, in Luke chapter 16 of the rich man and Lazarus, Joanne, who was poor, all right? Now, I don't, I can't tell you for a fact if that was a parable or if that was a true life story. I can't tell you that. Guess who does know? Jesus knows. And from where Jesus has always been, He could see where the rich man was. And He could see where Lazarus was. Now, let me say this to you. If this is a parable, then Jesus uses the highest form of flattery towards Lazarus because he labels that man Lazarus the name of his best friend. Isn't that cool? Wouldn't you like to believe that if you opened up the Bible and you saw your name in print in the Bible, Jesus was thinking of you? What about that? What about that? Nicodemus back there. Mary over there. Timothy. Daniel. All right. What about that? that? That when a name was put in print in the Bible, Jesus was actually referring to you. I want to say something, whether, again, I'm on the bubble or not. Jesus uses Lazarus' name in Luke chapter 16. These three are different, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus but he certainly loved them very deeply. Second thing I want to say about Lazarus and Jesus is this, that Lazarus is the subject of the greatest and most startling miracle recorded in the Gospels. Nothing is so fantastic as this. Now, wait a minute. Preacher, are you right? I'm going to say I am. There is nothing more fantastic than the faith of a saint who, when they believe in Jesus, they're in heaven. There's nothing that outdoes that. But when we come to the gospel and we think of miracles, there is no miracle in the Bible that is so fantastic as this. And by the way, let's look at the byproduct. The byproduct is that many Jews, many Jews believed in Jesus because of Lazarus's being raised from the dead. Third thing I'd like to say about this is his resurrection threatened the life that he had received from Christ as well as threatening Jesus' life himself. We read already that the Jews wanted to put Lazarus to death because Jesus raised him from the dead. May I say this, and I say this bravely and boldly. In the New Testament, the Jews who could look back and see all of the books of the Old Testament, by the time Jesus was here on earth, the whole Old Testament was in written form. Mind you, uh, when we look forward and um, uh, we see Philip, who was taken away out into the Gaza Strip, a big strip of desert, And when Philip is invited to walk alongside a chariot, and inside that chariot is a treasurer from Ethiopia, and he is reading the book of Isaiah, 
may I say this to you, by the time Jesus Christ was here on the face of this earth, the whole Old Testament was in complete volumes. And people could read it. The Old Testament is full of pointing towards Christ. If time permits, I did look at my watch. I see that one down there. Okay, Dakota? It's still coming at me, okay? All right. But if we have time, I'd like to point out some things that point us to this last week or so of Jesus Christ's life here on earth. But may I say this very simply, okay? That the, the Jews of Jesus' day could not see their nose straight in front of them. They could not see the tree because of the forest. They could not go through the Old Testament and see that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And twice we read in the Bible, at least twice, that the Jews tried to take this stuff and sweep it under the rug in the actual resurrection. When we talk about this on Easter Sunday, the Jews tried to hide the truth. Here, they try to destroy the evidence. Lazarus was risen from the dead by Jesus Christ, and that's the truth, and it remains. But, but Lazarus' resurrection was a threat to his own life as well as to the life of Jesus. The fourth thing I want to say about Lazarus and Jesus is this. Lazarus only comes out of the shadows one more time. And we find that in the 12th chapter of John. We don't really read about Lazarus before then. We see him being raised from the dead in John 11. We see him at a banquet in John chapter 12. But otherwise, he stays in the shadows. You and I might ask the question, why? Why is that? And I'm going to answer it for you. That because his life was threatened, but also it posed greater threat to Jesus' life, he tried to stay out of the limelight so that this anger would not be directed toward Jesus, his Lord. He tried to play it low. He felt his presence only increased our Lord's danger. All right. Now, pastor wants to say a few more things. You ready? As we take a look at this, and as we take um, a, a, a picture of this, in verse 8 of chapter 11, the disciples said to Jesus, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again? I want to help you understand something, because now we're two weeks away from Easter, and if you go back in your Bible and you look at the events of things that took place in those last week or so of Jesus' life, it's like a clock that was counting down towards Calvary. Ready? It was like a clock that was counting down towards Calvary. Uh, I was kind of playing around with a couple of words. Way back in the day, the place was actually called Cape Canaveral. Does anybody remember those words, Cape Canaveral? Uh, what is it? It's Kennedy something now, right? What, what is it? Kennedy what? Uh, okay, the Space Center. But back in my day when I was a kid... Um, in 1969, all eyes were glued on a TV. And at Cape Canaveral, there was going to be a launch. And that launch was going to send people to walk on the moon. That countdown had to be picture perfect, didn't it? It had to be within a few seconds or else they would miss the window. Uh, recently, uh, NASA sent a spacecraft to Mars... Uh, I understand it took seven months to get there. And everybody cheered because the timing was just right and there was a landing on Mars and a little buggy, uh, unmanned, uh, rolled out of that spacecraft and now is cr walking around or rolling around on the surface of Mars. May I tell you something? That countdown in human history has been very, very, very significant. But I want to say something to you. Mankind standing on the moon and walking around on it has done me no favors. Because we have a rover on the planet Mars, it has done me no favors. But there is one countdown in human history that do has done me the greatest favor that has ever been done for this poor boy. And that's the countdown to Calvary. 
Back in Genesis, do you remember after Adam and Eve sinned and God spoke to Eve and He said these words, I will put enmity between you and Satan and the woman between the seed and your seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall only bruise his heel. God was speaking to Satan. Sometime in the future, God said, I'm going to send someone who's going to bruise your head um, there was a movie, I can't remember the name of it, about the life of Jesus. And out in the garden, when Jesus was praying, it shows this, a ugly-looking serpent coming on the ground. And that actor playing the part of Jesus does this and grinds his heel on that serpent's head. Somebody say hallelujah. That's what Jesus did when He died for us. He came to destroy that enemy. In Genesis chapter 22, on Mount Moriah, on the very place where Jesus would die, Abraham was sent there with his son Isaac. And God asked him to sacrifice his son. Abraham Abraham had the knife in his hand, lifted it skyward, ready to aim it right into his son's heart. What did God say? Stop! I will supply a lamb. What does Abraham turn around and see? There it was. It was caught in the thicket. And God stopped Abraham from doing that, but God would not stop his own action when he sent his dearly beloved son to die for our sins. In the book of Exodus, when uh, Israel was to leave Egypt, they were to take the lamb and take the blood and splash it on the doorways. Okay, And the death angel would do what then? What did it do? passed over. In Psalm 22, you see the greatest description of the crucifixion. It is more detailed than the gospel themselves. That the details of Jesus' dying on the cross are outlined for you in Psalm 22. In Isaiah 53, He has no form or comeliness. And when we shall see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. His crucifixion was so horrible that the Gospels don't really describe it. It was the ugliest thing that mankind could have ever done to a person. John chapter 3, Jesus says this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's speaking of the crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 16, From that time forth, Jesus began to show His disciples how He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. Matthew chapter 16. Luke describes it this way. He said, Jesus Himself, He steadfastly set His face to go to Jerusalem. Matthew 26, You know, Jesus said, that after two days, uh, the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. In Matthew 26, also, we read that the chief priest said, No, 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 no. Let's not arrest Him during the Passover. Let's not kill Him on the feast day. There's multitudes here. Some estimate two million Jews in Jerusalem that week. And the high priest said, Don't kill Him on the Passover. We'll have a riot. Guess what? He died on the Passover anyway because there was a countdown to Calvary. In the upper room, as he and the twelve were having communion, he looks to Judas. That was the night before the Passover. That was a Thursday night. On Friday was the Passover. And he looks to Judas. And what does he say? What you do, do quickly. I believe in the mind of Judas... It clicked. Uh Uh-oh. He knows what we're up to. Before he can escape, I'm going to go tell the priest, we've got to do it tonight. There was a countdown to Calvary, boys and girls, and it was seconds within windows. It had to take place exactly then. In John 10, Jesus said, No man takes my life from me. I lay it down And as I lay it down, I will take it up again. Let me finish with this, guys. Matthew 11, or excuse me, John 11, verse 25. Find it. John 11, 25. In all of this, the countdown to Calvary, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, 
Jesus himself said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Come on, say something. Amen. Helen Steiner Rice wrote something. If you've ever gone to a funeral that I've done, many times I will read that poem. Helen Steiner Rice wrote a poem called The Bend in the Road. I won't read the poem to you. I like it. Um, uh, I believe it describes something very, very biblical. But in that poem, Helen says this, that you've not come to the end. You've only come to the bend in the road because the journey goes on. I'm going to ask you to bow your hearts and your heads with me. And I hope I've been some form of encouragement because Satan wants to speak to our hearts. He does that various ways. But Satan wants to come along and tell the Christian, you're a fool for believing this stuff. Our response is, no, you are the fool. You are the fool. Because you know you were there in heaven. You saw this all. Satan wants to be God of your life. Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And Jesus said this to Martha and Mary, Do you believe this? Make sure that Christ is in your heart. I don't know your age. I don't know where you're coming from necessarily. I don't know who's listening out there. But if you go through this life and face death without the resurrection in your heart, you're doomed. Please make sure that Christ is in your heart. And may I say this. May you please find that your life is following in His footsteps. Now, As we close our service, I've picked a pretty neat hymn. And as we sing it, I want you to think, picture this, that someday we'll be in our mansion. If you need to trust Christ, then we invite you to come and make that decision here and now this morning. If there's other decisions on your heart and on your mind, come and share them with the church this morning. Now, Lord... And just a spirit of prayer, we ask that you would move us to be obedient to your spirit. In Jesus' name. It's number 772. And um, uh, let us I'll tell you what, let's do this. Um, uh, I, let's sing the first two verses. Let's just sing the first two verses. Will you stand with me as we sing? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. Uh, Let's sing together. 772. The wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Help me out now. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Everybody say hallelujah. (laughs) what's going to be your first word when you get to heaven hallelujah right hallelujah wow what a place Uh, if you go before the resurrection um, 
uh, you might want to say, Jesus, don't call my name. I don't want to go back. Uh, no, no, don't pull a Lazarus on me. Oh, Lord, I, I say that out of respect. And so, Lord, we've, I hope we've enjoyed our time together. Oh, my. What a place we have to look forward to. To be with our Savior forever. Thank You for the love that You show us. And we can't imagine that it would be any greater than the love that You had for Lazarus. And so, Lord, thank You for giving Your life for us that we might have the life and the resurrection within us. Bless us this week. Help us to be Your missionaries wherever you